Happy New Year! This is the first broadcast of this year, Otaking Seminar on January 6th. Excuse me, but I've also been preparing until the last minute today. The reason I say sorry at the very beginning is that I didn't have time to have my hair cut. I should have definitely done that a month ago, but I traveled to the US thinking, well, I have to, I have to, and then I came back and collapsed, thinking, I have to, I have to. And today, this is how I look. I really should have done that yesterday. So sorry guys, I might look a little sleazy, but let me just go ahead with this. Oh well, shave your face. I did, I did, am I alright? Alright. I've described on SNS today as historical discovery. I'm introducing an actual animation cell of Om and the special feature of Nauska of the Valley of the Wind, aired on TV the day before yesterday. I don't really know how many times this has been aired, but it doesn't matter. The question is, what do you read from that? So, I will feature Nauska of the Valley of the Wind, this time as Buddha Nauska, or Nauska Wanderabout, like a famous TV show, Buddha Tamori, and try to think of the Valley of the Wind as a real scenery of a world that exists. When I went to the US, the air in the airplane was a bit dry, so I got a sore throat from the very beginning of my flight. It's not a cold, but I'm coughing a bit. Actually, this side of my cheek might look a bit chubby, or maybe not, because I'm licking a cough drop. Please let me go ahead with the cough drop in my mouth. At first, I would like to focus on the first 18 minutes. Uh, a comment just said, you're always chubby. Well, yes, you are right, but I still think it looks weird. All right, let's go with the first 18 minutes. Well, I guess you've seen a lot of the middle part of the story already, so I'm going to give a talk assuming that everybody has. In the so-called pre-credit, the part before the title is shown, Yupa visits a ruined village. Also, after the opening, he arrives at the castle in the Valley of the Wind. It takes about 18 minutes and 30 seconds up to here. I'm going to explain this part in the form of Buddha Nauska. Also, in the second half, I'll touch on what happened in the seven days of the fire. And finally, a little scary hidden theme of Nauska. Today's lecture note is also kind of thick, so I think it will take more than an hour and a half, or maybe two hours. But I hope you'll follow me. In fact, I've got such a thick note, but I know it's not going to all fit. So if I mean, since there is still more to talk about, I think we will continue the story of Nauska next week for the topics we could not cover today. All right, let's go from the first scene. Okay. This is the very first cut of Nauska of the Valley of the Wind. It is Yupa walking in the desert dust with a creature that can ride like a horse called Horse Claw. As you see, in the next cut below, some very small objects are falling around Yupa. You see? These may look like snow at first glance, but if you look very close, these are drawn like star shapes. If you're watching this on a smartphone, it may be hard to tell. But these are stars, not snow, but spores of fungi. Actually, the spores of fungi are drawn properly like this, only in this pre-credit before the opening. Only there, the spores are properly drawn in asterisk shape or star shape. But in the other scenes, they are drawn almost like snow. What this means is, we won't draw like this anymore. But if you see anything like snow in this movie, later on, they are all spores of fungi. In order to convey that, only in the pre-credit, in every cut, 
These are drawn like this, as detailed as possible. Well, it's a creator's request to say, please interpret it that way. When Yupa walks in the village, I think the cut here is really well elaborated. But a huge fungus mass on Yupa's head breaks out and spores from inside blow out like whoosh. There's another cut right here where you can see that when he's walking, the spores fiercely erupt from the patchy bulges on both sides of the road. So, around here, there are no spoken lines. A man walks in a desert-like area and sees a village over there. However, the whole village is covered with mushroom-like fungi. And when he gets closer, he sees that the fungi spores, which have been flickering, are now flooding all over the village. You can tell this is an unusual scene. The fungal mass above also swells to the max and breaks out like an eruption, and spores come out. I guess you remember this because you've just seen this on TV, the Friday Roadshow. This is an overwhelming power to convey solely with pictures. You can tell this is really an everyday scene in this world. Yupa explores around the village without a word. Then he finds a house and enters it. Actually, because there is a large decoration in front of the door of the house, you can see it's a house of someone important. When Yupa enters the house and looks around the room, at the darkest corner of the innermost room, where everything is covered with fungi, you suddenly see something like this in the back. Well, it's hard to tell at first glance, but it's a skull, or more like a mummified human corpse. If you look closely, it is a crown on the head. Because it has a crown, you can tell that the corpse is from the royal family. He headed toward the most outstanding building, breached the door, kicking to get inside. There is a man in the back of the room wearing a crown found dead. Now you realize, perhaps even the king or the patriarch of this village has died. Under this, there is a slightly smaller, mummified white bone. It is also wearing a matching small crown. So you know that this is the patriarch's wife or a child. In other words, he is dead hugging a small white bone with the same crown. Perhaps they were hugging each other in fear of the insect's invasion and ended up being suffocated with the spore poison miasma. This may be the wife or a child, we can't tell. But such royals died hugging each other in the corner of the most splendid room of the house they had made. And you can instantly understand that from the picture. Yupa himself also stays completely silent before them. Yupa expresses his emotions for the first time. After seeing this scene and realizing that no one survived, he says, yet another village is dead. From this line, yet another village is dead, you'll understand. Oh, this is just as usual. In this world, each and every village is covered with fungi. And perishes one after another. For those who have never read the original manga of Naushka, the first minute of the image of this world really means a lot. Hayao Miyazaki's animation actually explains pretty much everything by the spoken lines. But this part has really been expressed just by pictures. You'll also hear the man's voice and realize that he is an old man. With an old man's voice, you're told that this is something you find everywhere in this world. It's just normal. I see that doll of a child. When about to be taken up, its neck comes off when grabbed, 
and the fallen neck breaks into pieces and disappears. And even though this house shouldn't be such an old ruin, the doll quickly shatters, which indicates that things corrupt so quickly in this world. As you see from this doll, you'll find what the patriarch's mummy was holding was probably a girl, his very small princess. So, an ordinary happiness. Having this doll that, well, sorry to say that, but this is a cheap looking doll. Even this small village with a small princess who has such a cheap doll has been ruined. That means such an ordinary happiness is gone. But for Yupa, the adventure of this world, this is not the first time, but rather a usual thing. Until this point, it has been completely silent, except for scenes of the spores breaking out apart and blowing out. Because of the complete silence, the sound of Yupa kicking off the door and the monologue saying, yet another village is dead, sounds quite impressive. Here, the silence is suddenly broken by a terrible and creepy sound like gua gua gua. Then the scene switches suddenly from the dark room to a clear view like this. Then you see a huge insect flying in the sky. This is the first insect that appears in this movie. It's called Royal Yanma, or Giant Dragonfly. These were the ones growling out of the complete silence. The growl echoes and the insects fly around. Then in the next cut, a swarm of Royal Yanma is swirling around the windmill. Now, Yupa says, let's go. Soon this place too will be consumed by the toxic jungle, looking up at the insects with despair. This part so far is the pre-credit, or the part before the title. The toxic jungle and the insects are depicted as absolute evil at this point. They are evil and they threaten humans. So, the plot of the movie is that the world of insects and fungi, which we see at the beginning seem to be absolute evil, that ruins small, happy world we'd all want to protect. However, at the end of the movie, we somehow can no longer see that world as absolute evil. On the contrary, for some reasons, the world of fungi and insects even seem beautiful. This way, the viewer's mind is completely changed. That's the plot of this movie, that's Nauska, the Valley of the Wind. At this point, Yupa, uh, once again, walks into the desert, covered in despair, and... Here you go. The history of this world is told. A thousand years have passed since the collapse of industrialized civilization. A toxic jungle now spreads over the rough land covered with rust and ceramic fragments, threatening the survival of the last of the human race. It's a simple explanation. It says, rough land covered with rust and ceramic fragments. We tend to misunderstand, but um, this land is not covered by sand. A lot of people think that Naushka is set in a desert world, and the surroundings are full of sand. But I will explain this later, that there is no sand existing in this world anymore. Even no soil remains. The reason you see these colors on the ground is because there are only rust and ceramic fragments there, but no sand. It's about living in such a hopeless end of a world. I know this can be a little confusing. So how is it told in the comic version? The comic version explains a bit more, but it's long. This is the comic version. It's scary from the very beginning. Well, some colossal giants. I mean, these giants are much bigger than the buildings. And they are walking around and anyone who sees them can tell that they have this, hey, we'll destroy the city kind of attitude. 
And then you see this incredibly creepy text on the top. In a few short centuries, industrial civilization had spread from the western fringes of Eurasia to sprawl across the face of the planet. Plundering the soil of its riches, fouling the air, and remodeling life forms at will, this gargantuan industrial society has already peaked a thousand years after its foundation. A head lay abrupt and violent declined. The cities burned, welling up as clouds of poison in the war remembered as the seven days of fire. The complex and sophisticated technological superstructure was lost. Almost all the surface of the earth was transformed into a sterile wasteland. Industrial civilization was never rebuilt as mankind lived on through the long twilight years. See, pretty long. This time, to talk about Nashka, I will try to talk only about anime as much as possible. That's because the manga version continued after the animation was completed, so the way of thinking in Miyazaki changed several times. So there are some differences in the settings. So this time, we will talk about the anime Nashka without using the later part of the setting. Corresponding up to about volume 3 of the comic book, in other words, the part serialized as manga when the movie Nausicaa was made, I might refer to it a bit. But I will basically talk about the anime version. What we can see here is that industrialized society, written here is a society that began with the British Industrial Revolution. That is a thousand years after the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. Our current civilization, which reached its peak at around 2800 AD, was destroyed by the incident of Seven Days of Fire. It's a thousand years since the collapse, so I'd say the present day as depicted in Nausicaa is around 3800 AD. So, what's happened to our industrial society during those 800 years? Let me gradually solve that mystery in the second half. The first half will be Buddha Nausicaa. Before Hayao Miyazaki himself made that movie, he said many times that the purpose of this movie was not to depict Nausicaa, but to depict the Valley of the Wind. Now, having said that, let us experience the Valley of the Wind and their life together, along with the footsteps of Yupa after the opening. Okay, so here is the first point of Buddha Nausicaa. Oops, I need to explain the situation first. So, there is a scene where Om comes out in rage and Nausicaa saves Yupa under attack. I think everyone has already seen the movie, so play it back in your brain. Yupa is attacked by Om, then saved by Nausicaa, his former disciple. Nausicaa yells to him on her glider called Maeve, get up wind of it. Yupa is surprised at the growth of Nausicaa. Oh well, that was Nausicaa. He didn't recognize it at first glance. He climbs on the dunes with surprise. Then there are many strange towers standing there. This is the first point of Buddha Nausicaa, insect repellent tower. Well, as Yupa climbs up the hill, stone towers stand on the dunes and many strange windmills are attached and making humming noises. According to the storyboard, this is an insect repellent tower, and it says when the windmill rotates with the wind, an unpleasant sound for insects is produced. Look at here, up close. Can you zoom in? It's hard to see, but there are small holes in the middle of the windmill blades. As these blades rotate, the air passes through the holes, producing low-frequency sound, similar to the insect charm Nausicaa has. It's a sound insects dislike. So there is a tower to prevent insects flying from the toxic jungle to the valley of the wind in the setting. Well, it's something like a mosquito guard. There's a product called ultrasonic mosquito repellent that emits ultrasonic with a single AA battery to keep insects away, so think of it like that. It seems to be it's too much to just do this trick. So I think there should be another rule of this tower, which is to indicate the strength and direction of the wind. So yes, it does repel the insects, but there's another function. The valley of the wind can only exist thanks to the wind, blowing up from the sea, 
that protects the people from the spores and miasma, the deadly poison that drift from the sea of corruption. In other words, wind is everything for them. If the wind stops or blows backward, the village will soon die. Miyazaki himself wrote about this. Of course, the wind sometimes blows from different directions. So they have some techniques and mechanisms to survive through them somehow. But he didn't explain exactly what it was. So that's what we need to interpret from the material shown. Like, we need to think, if the wind in the Valley of the Wind flows backward, how will they protect themselves? One way is this insect repellent tower. They have some structure like a gearbox somewhere around here. That's the mechanism to know. For example, when the rotation speed changes. Therefore, when the wind direction or speed changes, some other sound comes off instead of the insect repellent sound. Or maybe in addition to the insect repellent sound, there could be a function to generate some ticking sound or a higher pitch sound to notify someone with good hearing in the valley of the wind. Even though I'll use my imagination, the main purpose of Buddha Naushka is to analyze what it was that Miyazaki really tried to depict in this movie. That's going to be the main goal of my analysis of Naushka. This insect repellent tower itself is written on the storyboard as a setting. But shouldn't there be any other mechanism in the tower that can tell the direction of the wind? That's my imagination. Next, I'll interpret from the image, not from a written text. This tower is made of stone and the reason for that is what looks like sand is not actually sand. As I explained, they are rust and ceramic fragments. There is no such thing as iron in this world. While Miyazaki was making this film, he told Isao Takahata, a Ghibli producer and creator, everything that looks like sand in this world is a ceramic fragment, and there is no longer any ordinary sand or earth. Then Takata was quite amused and said, Oh, that's a story about people living in such a world? It's amazing! You should depict it in detail. That's going to make this truly a science fiction. And it should be meaningful to draw the strength of those who make their living in such a world. When Takahata got excited and said that. But when Miyazaki heard that, he responded, I don't have time to do that. I only have two hours. So they had a big fight. Takahata said, it's nonsense to just have them in your head. Visualize them if you thought about them. But Miyazaki said, I can't put anything else in the movie if I do that. In other words, the difference between Takahata, who later ended up drawing the process of making cotton flowers in only yesterday, and Miyazaki, who gets angry saying it's nonsense to draw such scenes, can already be seen here. Takahata thinks everyday details as well as daily lives of people should be depicted first. What is in the world and how do you live? And to that end, that's fine to end up with a less interesting film. On the other hand, for Miyazaki, who, despite making a movie like Lupin III and Castle of Cogliostro, packed with a lot of fun, but tanked at the box office, was deprived of any chance to make work for many years, and was like, this is my last chance. I have to get a box office smash, so I have to make an amusing story. So of course they'd fight. So, since no incident, no story is the motto in Miyazaki's work, there are many settings that are drawn in the pictures but not explained in the story. One of them is the stone tower. So with Buranaushka method, I will try to describe Miyazaki's true vision of the Valley of the Wind and what was in his head as much as possible. As I said, there is no more iron existing in this world. The reason is that all materials have been replaced by ceramics many years ago. Iron and other materials have already been excavated and all have been replaced by ceramics. That's super ceramic, a fictitious material made up by Miyazaki. This super ceramic is not like pottery as we imagine today, but some dream material that can freely produce the property no matter how thin, strong, or flexible it is. 
So no one tries to find or use an alternative materials or matters. Even for the clothing, Miyazaki refers to this as ceramic civilization, as everything is made of ceramic. What this means is that this is a replacement for our oil civilization, materials that did not exist until about 150 years ago, such as plastic or any petroleum products, came into our lives. Today, even if you think you're wearing cotton clothing, for example, petroleum-based ink could be used as its printing material. So anyway, petroleum is used everywhere in our lives. This is our civilization, but what Miyazaki imagined is that with further evolution, everything is made of ceramic. Since it's so convenient, no matter how soft, hard, colored, or durable it should be, ceramic is the best material in all aspects. So, you no longer need to use any other materials. And this ceramic can not only be made by baking clay, like what we do today, but also from various materials. So ordinary materials such as wood or iron existed before have been replaced by ceramic. So in this world, there are actually no other resources but the abundant ceramic materials. If there is the technology to produce ceramics, there should have been any problem. But since the technology to recycle them has been lost. The world became a place where there is not only non-recyclable ceramics, and the desert with such materials has been created, and the world has passed the point of no return. Therefore, in the Valley of the Wind, metal parts, or anything that looks like metal parts, for example, such as the fittings that look like metal used in the windmills, are often carved from blocks of ceramics. Therefore, in the world of Naushka, newly made items look very rugged in shapes. That's because those easy-to-handle metals, such as iron and brass, are all gone. They have large aircrafts, for example. Valley of the Wind has gunships. Or as they come out later in the movie, Pejait or Tomekia have large aircrafts, which they call airships. They have been excavated and used. But once they need to repair their parts, the only way is to carve ceramic pieces into similar shapes from scratch. Because there are no other materials. So, this insect repellent tower did not exist before the industrial civilization collapsed. There was no such insects at the time. Therefore, they had to start from scratch. So, what happened was that the Valley of the Wind had to return to the Stone Age in a sense. Returning to the Stone Age, they've built this tower by stacking pebbles. Indeed, they can make some parts of the windmill from some materials preserved somehow, or from the trees growing there. And they can also scrape off the ceramic products or fragments, but all these are piled up in the form of shattered ceramic pebbles or remainings, as if they were back at the Stone Age. That's why the buildings of the Valley of the Wind are made of bricks, clay, and stone. They've returned to the Stone Age. This is not an exaggeration, but rather based and modeled on the historical fact that the whole Europe was suddenly degenerated to the Stone Age after the fall of the Roman Empire, which ruled Europe with scientific civilization. Sorry to bring up something like a classroom subject. But Roman civilization was famous for its Roman aqueducts and marble buildings. However, maintaining this Roman civilization required huge forest resources. So they had to cut down forests all over Europe in a little over 500 years. Of course, the Roman Empire was ruined by the invasion of different ethnic groups, but once the civilization was ruined, no one could repair the aqueducts or marble buildings. Nobody knew how those were made anymore, and no forest or timber were left for the foundations. So they couldn't even return to the time where they constructed the building with trees. So, after the fall of Roman civilization, for nearly a millennium, some parts of Europe were brought back to almost the Stone Age stage, while others somehow tried to maintain the former cultural or technological standards. Until the forest was rejuvenated and the Renaissance began, the Middle Ages was really called the Dark Ages for this reason. 
The same is true for the Valley of the Wind. We can't do anything without a smartphone today, right? Similarly, without the help of ceramic or creatures created by genetic engineering, humans in this age, which is 800 years from now, can no longer live. Thousands of years after the collapse of civilization, the people of the Valley of the Wind have finally gone through the post-ceramic age and are moving to slightly better era than the Stone Age. Such an era is described, which you can see from the stone structure of this insect repellent tower. After this scene, Naushka... Oops, this one. She comes down yelling, Lord Yupa! Naushka's vehicle, which is like a hang glider, is called Maeve. It is also an ancient heritage. Like the gunship that will come out in the movie later, it can't be repaired anymore. And it works with some power of which they don't even understand the mechanism. So it is something very precious. But Naushka rides the wind with it very well. This is the scene where Naushka lands with Maeve. When she tries to lower the altitude, it slightly soars up and the altitude rises. Then it drops sharply right afterwards. What this means is that she is trying to avoid passing by Yupa with this speed and angle. So she tilts the glider upward once. As a result, Maeve ascends once slightly, then it loses speed and sharply drops from there. It looks like Maeve is flying up again for a moment but then it quickly comes back down. Finally, she slowly descends by manipulating the aircraft. So, she is pretty good at maneuvering. The movie captures the realistic movements of flying by showing how Naushka lands. This is how Naushka's posture looks like at the landing. She extends her legs as the speed drops. And once she touches the ground, she bends her knees to land, abandons Maeve, and crouches to dash at a stretch. As she crouches to dash, she bends over and runs straight to this side immediately. She takes off her mask the hood and the goggles while running and at this point finally the heroine appears she rushes down taking her mask off and shows her face as her face close up cut in then she yells Lord Yupa I couldn't capture it but the next cut is the close up of Naushka's left hand so you can see how fast she runs toward the screen there's no unnecessary movement here so, if you see all these as a sequence, it's hard to tell. But she comes down, turns right, dashes toward the center of the screen. But drifts slightly to this side due to inertia, to the right side of the screen. So she runs in a curve toward us. It's really a scene by an absolute illustrating genius. So the way to enjoy here as Buranaushka is at the moment of landing. When she lands, you see a foreshadowing for the climax in the background. What you see behind is the acid sea. In front of it is the wreckage of the spaceship in which all the people in the Valley of the Wind take shelter during the last battle. So, in other words, in this first scene, it already shows clearly the situation of the last scene, where a spaceship is abandoned at slightly higher than the Valley of the Wind near the Acid Sea. And as for this spaceship, when director Hideaki Anno first saw it in the storyboard, and then in the layout, since design was so unimpressive, he said, this is more like a submarine. Can't we think again a little more? 
But Miyazaki didn't even listen to it. Ano complained even in audio commentary of the DVD. Miyasan never cares about what he is not interested in. He kept bugging us on so many things like, you guys don't study at all. You're not going to make anything good. But look at that spaceship. It's like a submarine. No good. No good. He said, well, that's really true. In any event, Miyazaki didn't forget to show such a thing as a visual foreshadowing from the very beginning. This is a conversation between Yupa and Naushika after a long absence. Naushika, I didn't recognize you, says Yupa. It's been over a year now, Naushika answers. So they met for the first time in over a year. However, when she's asked, so how is your family, she starts looking gloomy, Yupa asks, what's wrong? And she says, it's that father can't fly anymore. Yupa is surprised. King Jill? So, the jungle's poisons are taking their toll. Nashka answers, yes! Father says it's the fate of all of us who live near the jungle, and Yupa says, I'm sorry, I should have come sooner. So, Nashka's father, Jil, the patriarch or the king of the Valley of the Wind, has been in bed from the beginning of the movie, but it hasn't been for so long. He was fine when Yupo was in the Valley of the Wind a year and a half ago. So he used to be fine, but is now in bed and can't move anymore in just a year and a half. His disease caused by the jungle's poison got worse so quickly. As she says, he can't fly anymore, it means the old man in bed in the movie actually used to fly just a year and a half ago. When I discovered this, I thought, like, hey, wait a minute, I thought Jill was in bed for a long time, but wait, can't fly anymore? Means actually he flew until a year and a half ago? That was a surprise. So, it was only recently that Naushka inherited and started flying with the Maeve. I was surprised. The fate of all of us who live near the jungle, Naushka says. This Naushka's gloomy line is also the theme of this film. In the anime, the Valley of the Wind is depicted like a utopia. A director, Mamoru Oshi, has criticized this severely. But behind the scene, as I have just said, life is quite harsh, such that people become bedridden in just one and a half years, as you realize gradually. This is because what Hayao Miyazaki wanted to do was to depict desert people, even in his debut manga. He dealt with the theme, why do humans live in such a harsh environment as the desert? And how should I say, um, I brought this up when I gave a talk on Porco Rosso. But there is a novel called Wind, Sand and Stars by Saint Exupery, also depicting a harsh environment of South American and African deserts. The reason why humans live in such an environment is that by being exposed to the wind in such a cruel environment, so to speak, living in a harsh nature that is not friendly to humans, their humanity and spirituality will be enhanced. Miyazaki read this in his youth, was really shocked and became obsessed with an idea of why do desert people live in the desert since then? Why don't the desert people live in water-rich areas? Because they do not settle but keep relocating. But we may think, if they can move around, why don't they just live in a more comfortable place? How come they bother to choose places that are hard to live? That's the question that comes out in all of Miyazaki's animation works, the major theme that comes out many times in his films. It is because there is a community that is worth supporting, worth living in such places with, even if it gives them a hardship. And you can start to see that kind of theme in Naushka. The Iron Town of Princess Mononoke is a typical example. In Princess Mononoke, that was depicted as the theme of the film in a more straightforward way. Then why is the Valley of the Wind worth supporting? Why do Naushka and the people live in such a poisonous place that could take her father's life? If you watch this movie, or maybe on TV, just aimlessly, it might look to you like because they're friends to believe in each other, because there is peace, or because they live with nature. However, for Naushka and the people, life in the Valley of the Wind should be something more cruel indeed. 
So, to what extent should their life in such a cruel environment be depicted? This was where Miyazaki and Takahata had a big fight, as I mentioned earlier. I would like to cover this major theme in detail in the limited broadcast. Well, so Naoshika meets Yupa again, and in order to bring the good news that Lord Yupa is here to everyone in the valley, are we alright? It's about 40 minutes already, only a little over half of the first half has been covered. So, I'm going to have to extend the first half. I'm sorry. I don't think I can finish within 90 minutes today. Well, please sit back and relax. So, to bring the good news that Lord Yupa is here to the castle where her father, the king, awaits, she jumps off from the cliff at once. Here again, the scene jumps from a simple dialogue to a grand view with the music like ta 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 a scene suddenly appears where Naushka carries Maeve and makes a big jump off from the cliff. Let me stand up. Look at this from the bottom to the top. So as Naushka makes a big jump off the cliff, you can barely see a road below the cliff. As you follow all the way along this cliff, you can see a shiny area ahead like this. It means that this valley slowly curves toward the right. Naushka flies to the Valley of the Wind. The cliff to the Valley of the Wind is actually slightly curved. It's curved and Naushka flies along that curve. This road, as you see later when Yupa gets through, is a narrow, narrow road carved on the cliff, which is barely enough for one person to pass. Along this, Naushka flies by and vanishes far away. Okay, so the geography of the Valley of the Wind has almost never been... Uh, how should I say? Never been visualized before. The bottom of the Valley of the Wind cannot be viewed due to the large right turn. As you can see from the fact she jumps off from here, the acid sea that you can see almost at the last scene actually exists on a plateau about 1,000 meters above the sea level. While the Valley of the Wind is located near the sea at almost zero meters from the sea level, at the bottom of the cliff, which is so much lower than the acid sea and the toxic jungle that are 1,000 meters above the sea level, this height difference itself is the basis of the existence of the Valley of the Wind. That's why there are two oceans appearing in this movie. One is a safe sea called the Salt Sea near the Valley of the Wind, from where the wind blows in. Well, even though it's a safe sea, Naushka and the people do not run any fishery there. So, this sea is basically dead. On the other hand, from Naushka's side, all the way up about 1,000 meters above the valley, there is the acid sea in the desert, and the toxic jungle beyond that. So they live between those two oceans. So, please grasp the whole structure of the Valley of the Wind where they live in such a narrow space. Okay. Let me drop this to this side. Now... Okay, now I can sit and talk for a while. As I mentioned earlier, Yupa goes down the hill along the narrow path carved on the cliff. Because Yupa is not on Maeve like Naushka, he has no choice but to walk down. So he rides a horse-like creature called Horseclaw and goes down the road along the valley. Then some dust flows like this from his feet toward the top of the cliff. So, the wind blowing here is not just a wind, but contains sand. The sand blows off spores from the acid seas and the toxic jungle. It's not just a wind, but from the acid sea. As you see on the right side of this picture, miasma poisons and spores come down from the top of the mountain. Sand is added to the wind to blow them off. As Yupa descends the valley, what appears before him is a giant sand louver. 
This is also described in the storyboard. It means a louver to keep sand away. And there are several of these along the way. Under the louver, sand is stored. You see sand smoke rising from the lower part of the louvers, or from the bottom, right? What it does is that um, some of the sand comes down from the toxic jungle and some sands come from the salt sea. But all the sand is once knocked down by the rotating wings and stored underneath. When the wind from the salt sea rises, the sand is blown up and back toward the toxic jungle. This is the system built by the Valley of the Wind over the years. Like the insect repellent tower, as you can see, the material of the tower is stone. It's a stone masonry. These wings are made of wood and cloth. And what they do is, as I said, keep the dust from the acid sea away, and at the same time blow it upward with the wind from the salt sea. According to Miyazaki's initial setting, though the village is right below here, all the villagers lived in the castle, not the village. What it means is that, until this sand louver was ready to use, everyone was often sheltered in the highly airtight castle. When something happened, everyone had to quickly escape into the castle. So that was why the castle of the Valley of the Wind was made so big. Although there are only 500 people in the valley, the castle is obviously oversized, but that's a matter of course. That's because it was also a large-scale accommodation where all the people had to shelter in for several days until the direction of the wind changed back. That's why the castle was made so big. However, because the sand louver was built, it could now somehow... Um, how should I say, constantly blow the wind back to protect the valley. And the villagers didn't have to live inside the castle anymore. That's why Miyazaki's initial setting was not used. As Yupa moves forward, the bottom of the sand louver I just mentioned appears. Yupa looks up from below and here you can see it in a different composition, which tells you how he has descended to the bottom of the valley. And you can also tell that each of these towers are made of stone. As you can see from this picture, the valley of the wind is at the bottom of the valley with a bigger height difference than you imagined. A huge shelf board is rotating. It functions to first knock down the spores and the dust that flew in from the toxic jungle, and then blow them back with the wind from the salt sea. I don't know how many years it took them to complete it since they came up with the idea of this mechanism, but it's really terrifying to imagine their lives back then. The village could be easily wiped out just by the wind occasionally stopping or changing its direction, so everyone had to live near the castle at all times. So even when they were on farm work, they needed an alert instantly when the wind changed. They had to set up a windmill at the insect repellent tower, and when they heard the sound change, Changing from clicking noise to ticking noise, everyone had to stop everything and run toward the castle to escape. They live for generations and generations in this situation. Under such circumstances, they've built this village with stones little by little. That's the reason why. People in the Valley of the Wind spare no effort to secure the wind and water. When you just watch Naushika, you may think the villagers in Miyazaki anime are kind of boring. Everyone is good and hardworking and acts like a good person. So the villagers in his movie are like, whatever. Well, no way. The reason why everyone is a hard worker is that the life in the Valley of the Wind is poor and harsh. So lazy people can't live and cannot even survive. When they built these louvers, what they had in mind was that his huge tower, once completed, will make the village safe. But there are so many layers of them, and it's the most dangerous moment when they start building from the outside. Because if you go there, it's more likely you die early when the wind comes. Even King Jill was in the safe part of the Valley of the Wind. He quickly became ill and was going to die in just a year and a half, right? 
In such an environment, they work surrounded by the dust, the most dangerous substances, flying from the toxic jungle. It's like working in a nuclear power plant site, surrounded by radioactive substances, and you have to do this for generations and generations to complete it. So, when they built the louvers, everyone who piled up the stones to build the tower should have died early in their youth. They knew they would die early. But if they didn't keep piling the stones up, such a thing would not be completed. My father died, I would die earlier than the others, and my little son now helping with me here will die early likewise. Unless they work for generations, they cannot build these layers of huge structures from a layer to another. But if we don't get them done, our grandchildren and their children will remain as short-lived as we do. At the expense of their ancestors' lives, these sand louvers have been built. That's why when Yupa passes by this place, he looks up with respect. It may seem to you like Yupa is thinking, Oh, I've just arrived at the Valley of the Wind, it's been a long time. Yeah, well-built sand louvers, good ones. But what comes to Yupa's mind here is actually, I've passed by many ruined villages. But here the people, here, have worked so hard for generations and generations knowing they would die for this. That's why this village still exists. It's his admiration toward those people. Some emotional music is overlaid too. So this seemingly ordinary scene where Yupa just passes by the sand louvers becomes so impressive and this scene always truly touches my heart. But this is also what Isao Takahata got angry about. Then make that into a picture, he says. You're thinking that far, all right? Then visualize it. But Miyazaki said, no, if I drew it, the story would not progress. Here Yupa is looking up at that way. The louvers are spinning around. This is just cool enough. Takahata was like, no, no, that's not enough. Here you can see the difference between Takahata, who wants to depict people, and Miyazaki, who wants to depict incidents. So, for this part, we have to understand by ourselves. Why did he get so angry? Why does Yupa look up the louvers that when he passes by them? That's not because the landscape is beautiful. It's because, thanks to the accomplishments of their ancestors just a few generations ago, such things have been built. That's why I really like this scene. After passing through the sand louvers, Yupa arrives at a pumping windmill. Finally, he's entering the Valley of the Wind. As Yupa passes through the gate of this pumping windmill, you can see many sand louvers behind it. In other words, as I mentioned earlier, you can see that these layers of sand louvers protect the village. Farther away, the valley continues on the right. You can see layers of wind louvers or sand louvers along. These spinning windmill is for um, water supply. It is for pumping up the water carried all the way here to the place above. The walls and windmills are all made of stones. Generally, in the United Kingdom or its countryside, you'll see more of this kind of stone building and the brick buildings. And basically, that means it's a poor region. So, you see these structures, but these stones are not made of rocks. But as I mentioned before, probably the fragments of huge ceramic buildings that fell and shattered, which are carefully selected and piled up. Since they are not of the same size like bricks, they have to be stacked by trial and error. If they are piled up crudely, they will collapse later on. And above all, since it deals with water line, precious water will overflow and spill out into the ground. So, probably between the stones, the gap should be filled and fixed with some cement like materials made of fine dust of ceramic raked up. As you see from the water that's coming out, what looks like a wall here is not a wall, but a Roman aqueduct, a huge one. In other words, what it does is that the water is pumped up and stored inside of the entire wall. This windmill pumps up the water from below, which is not groundwater. I will explain later, but the Valley of the Wind has a water source only about 500 meters below the castle.
The source of water is first lifted from 500 meters under the castle, which is located in a relatively low position, and then sequentially pumped up from the castle to the top of the step terrace, using various windmills and finally stored here. That's why water overflows from the walls. There are water outlets here for accumulated water. Up to this position, the water is pumped up by the power of the windmill. The reason for the height difference of each outlet is to identify the water level, to see how much water is stored in it at a glance. If all of them are at the same height, you can only tell that the water left inside is up to that height. But as the water is coming out of the holes at different heights, people can tell, oh, that much water is stored in this village for now, from far away at a glance. In other words, when the water comes out only from the low outlets, everyone has to save water. When the water also comes out from the high outlets, it is safe and you can smile with relief. The viewers can understand that instantly just by looking at the picture. However, we just watch this along casually and think, Hey, Yupa, why don't you go to see Jill real quick? Or Naushka, are you there? But as Buddha Naushka, if you look carefully, you can see that the scenes are drawn based on the consideration that far. Now, the comment says, How could I know that? Or why wouldn't they explain them? I am here to explain these kind of things to you, so don't worry, guys. Use me as a supplementary tool. Here, the wall is filled up with water, so everyone should be happy. As Yupa passes by these pumping windmills, a huge reservoir appears. Well, even if I say huge, it's actually a modest one. Here, Yupa gives horse claw water. And... It's a modest reservoir, but for a village with a population of 500, this amount of water is quite blessed. As you can see from the geographic situation, there's a Roman aqueduct here, and the water is dropping. The reservoir is at the highest place in the Valley of the Wind. In other words, the persistence to pump up the water to this point created the reservoir. I have drawn a map of the whole structure around the Valley of the Wind, so I'll show you later. The bottom of the reservoir is covered with stones like tiles, to keep the water from escaping. It is shown in the scene where the horse claws drink water. This kind of thing is not only hard to make, but also needs a lot of time and effort on maintenance, since the inside often cracks and water seeps out. After passing by this reservoir, thanks for waiting, it's finally the Valley of the Wind. So as Yupa talks to these old men and slowly walks toward the left side of the screen, the further left side becomes brighter. Then the panoramic view actually looks like this, and here, you can finally see the whole view of this valley. As Yupa descends the valley, he walks unsteadily through a path along the cliff. He then passes by, looking up the sand louvers, then by the windmill. After he finally passes by the reservoir, you'll see the whole setting for the first time, at the beginning of the film to show the valley of the wind. A lot of panning shots are used. By panning horizontally or vertically, they are trying to show a large-scale picture. This way, the windmills, about 10 of them, stand one after another all the way far out, as you can see to the castle where Naushka and her father lives. That's the structure of the whole landscape. You can also see the vineyard around. After passing the reservoir and the vineyard, you can finally see the whole view of the Valley of the Wind far below. What you see below is the castle where the king lives, located about 100 to 200 meters below. Usually, royals or kings tend to live in a higher land to overlook the distance, but the Valley of the Wind is upside down. The higher in the valley, the more dangerous it is, with incoming spores from the toxic jungle. So the king actually lives at the bottom. 
Those 10 windmills or so you can see from here are all pumping windmills. That is, they draw water by wind power. It isn't underground water that the windmills deal with. What they do is to lift water from its source 500 meters below the castle, pump it up by the windmills over the step terraces one by one and finally to the reservoir just mentioned. There is nothing natural in this landscape. It is a land which has been created by Nauska's ancestors from scratch for survival. For example, the soil in the orchard was also made from scratch. In this world, which is basically covered with ceramics, all they can do is carefully search and select every single piece of true sand and soil, one by one, that has remained from this ruin. The soil is made by the ancient true sand and soil grains raked one by one, mixed with organic water such as fallen leaves and their own excrement, which then is by stirred and laid down for years. This is not a fictional story. The reason why I can talk about this as if it's real is because that was what the American pioneers did. Back then, America was so spacious, but most were barren land and could not harvest any crop. The pioneers of such a land had to make the soil first, crushing stones, mixing them with calcium and fertilizer, fallen leaves, their excrement, and thoroughly cultivating every day. And after several years, they could finally get a land where corn could be harvested. Unlike in Japan, where some lands are, well, naturally fertile, while some aren't. In America, every farmland is something like farmers had to create. That's why they insisted on their land so much to the extent that they could immediately pull out a rifle and dispute with their neighbors. Of course, for example, in California, there were some places where you could grow corn just by spreading the grains without doing anything. But in the windy Midwest, so-called dusty bowl phenomena often took place, so the soil on the surface was constantly blown away. Then the land returned to the state of a barren land with no topsoil and they had to make soil again. The Midwestern Americans fled to California in despair when all the soil was blown out of their lands. And this actual event inspired a novel and a movie called The Grapes of Wrath in the early 20th century. As such events happened even in the early 20th century, soil was really something they had to make. Knowing that, you can understand how extraordinary this landscape is. The windmills may look just elegant, but if even one of them stops, the water supply to the reservoir also stops. Then the orchard trees will die. It just looks like beautiful nature, but this land is like a jewel, all of which was created by dozens of generations working until they died. Okay, wow, it's past nine o'clock. So let me finish around here for the free broadcast. As I promised, since the animation cells of Ohm were discovered, I will show them to you. I have already talked about how these came to me in Nico Nico livestream on May 6, 2018, so check that out for details. To be more specific, anime shops used to sell animation cells in the past. That doesn't mean all cells were sold at the shops. First of all, the cells had to be sorted into what could be sold or not. There are companies that mediate business between the filming studios and the anime shops. Cells first come from the filming studio as industrial waste. To be more precise, for example, a company called Topcraft made Naushka, but Topcraft didn't sell the cells to anime shops directly. In case of Topcraft, after the shooting of Naushka was over, they thought they didn't need the cells used for the shooting anymore. So they disposed them as um, industrial waste. Then the middle company said, ah, you don't have to pay for industrial waste disposal. We will take them for free, but instead we sell the good ones to the anime shops. Would that be okay? So that being said, the anime production company, usually struggling with cash flow, accepts the offer saying like, oh, well, we are grateful if you can do that. 
Then the middle company tried to sort out from such a huge amount of discarded cells, but most of them are worthless cells, such as just a mouth for a limp sink or just a hand. Among such waste, when they finally found some useful ones, they combined them with background pictures, stapled them together, put them in a bag, and sold them for three to five dollars. So that's what happened back in the days and how the cells of Naushka were discovered. Okay, now please give me the first small one. Thank you so much. Right now, I am touching the cardboard part, but from now on, I will wear gloves. This is why I can't show these that often. Unless I wear gloves, because these are so precious and priceless. This is called the ohm cell prototype. These are the separated parts. Each one is, do you see? Cut from a painted cell, so ohm is made of separate parts. This cell is painted directly on the back, like this. So what you see from the front side is actually painted from the back side, imagining how the front side should look like. Quite an artisanship. So these are painted like this, cut out into pieces as uh, separate parts and then combined into an ohm shape. Let me show you the actual motion. Please give me the next vertical one. This is the real cell used in the scene where the ohms attack. Is it alright? No reflection of the light? Okay, so if I pull this black part below, the individual parts that were cut out, oops, sorry. The individual parts that were cut out will move in conjunction with each other. Well, let's just do it rather than verbally explaining. Are we alright? Look at the upper part. They move like this. See that? It's really like the motion in the movie, isn't it? This was how the film was really shot, by actually moving these parts, so the ohm really looks alive. I found three different types of ohm cells, so lastly, let me introduce the biggest one. Okay, thank you. Colossal, huh? Yes, yes. This is the biggest one. This is for the scene where the ohm moves sideways. Now, let's pull. This is how it works. Do you see? This was how Naushka was made. Now, underneath the cells are very fine lines called gauges, which indicate where the cell parts are currently located, so you can tell how many millimeters to pull which part to make what motions. It's now moving with a shaky motion because this is supposed to be placed horizontally and shot from directly above, not like this. So it's shaking, but if you put this horizontally, it should move smoothly. Thank you so much. Would you give me the vertical cell again, please? Okay, I may have said fixed with rubber, but I think it's hard to tell. I want to show the rubber part. Even if it takes some time, I'll touch it carefully. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> if you look at the back, you can see how the rubber is attached. But if worse comes to worse, this can break, so please forgive me for not showing the rubber part. There you go. Oh, that was scary. <laughs> Let me take off the gloves. Gee, that was scary. So...
It's so called pastel chalk. The textural look of the cells turn out totally different from that of ordinary cells, but not many people know how they are made. I like these sort of things, as I like special effects. Process of animation making is mostly drawing, painting, and directing actions and movements. But sometimes it's made by craft work like this, which awakens my love towards crafts. Now, this fall in Hollywood, a movie museum will be opened. That will be the world's largest movie museum in the world. And I heard that the first special exhibition there is about Hayao Miyazaki. So my guess here is that the new Miyazaki movie is now forecasted to be finished sometime next year. The story about the movie museum spread as uh, news sometime at the end of last year. But I have already speculated that Suzuki gave an okay because Miyazaki's new work seemed to be finished soon. In fact, there was an on informal contact from an official of the museum at the end of last year. They said, it seems that you are taking care of the Ohm cells, so by all means, we would like to display them at our first special exhibition that features Miyazaki. But now, I only keep them, but not own them. So I asked the owner indirectly through the owner's proxy. The person who really owns these cells does not want to disclose their identity or stand out. So they said to me, I do not want to appear in public. So I would appreciate it if you could negotiate as a proxy for the time being. So at this moment, the owner is considering whether to lend them to the Hollywood Museum. I haven't heard the decision yet, so I don't have anything more to talk about that. However, since these are such precious materials, I think it's better to show people all over the world. So if there comes any follow-ups, I will let you guys know. So that's all for today's free broadcast. Oh well, I already talked for one hour and ten minutes. Please bring up the questionnaire. In the second half is still going to be Budanaushka. We finally have come to the top of the valley. So from here on, I will show my sketch schematic of the whole landscape of the Valley of the Wind, which nobody has ever thought of or elucidated. Not only that, I made two sketches, top view and a sectional side view. It took humongous effort to draw them. In the second half, I'll show the schematics, talk about what sort of war the Seven Days of Fire was, and how the buried version of Naushka would have ended. Then I'll talk about the truth about Naushka that's 10 times scarier. Next week I will talk about Whisper of the Heart and the rest of Naushka. Now please show me the result. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Today about 99% selected good. It's getting better. Now, all right then, we don't have much time left, so let's just go on and on. Please switch to the second half.